Hello. Okay. Here's another hello with a microphone. <clears throat> okay. So this is the uh, Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund, and I will continue with my reading and commentary on the uh, important study and book published by Cambridge University Press, which is entitled Socialist, This Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State. That is during the time of the Second International. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld speaking, a political science uh, graduate of the University of Quebec Montreal. And I have to bring this uh, research to the attention of of those who uh, uh, think in the tradition of the Marxist um, theory, which is illustrated here as being uh, deficient in its uh, analysis of uh, anti-Semitism and uh, not uh, capable of confronting the condition of anti-Semitism by reason of alienation from the Jewish people as a whole, even by the Jewish Marxists who sought the process of assimilation to resolve the what's called the Jewish question or the Jewish problem, which is made out to be a problem of the Jewish people when in fact it is a problem of the nation state and its theocratic nature being an exclusively Christian phenomenon, which excludes, excluded the Jewish people until the uh, factor of annihilation took place and therefore cannot be discounted and it cannot be trivialized. This is what we're talking about here. And uh, we have to analyze the de deficiencies of the Marxist theory, theoretical approach in the classical Marxist tradition of the 19th century. And uh, we're going to continue to do so. Here we go. And where is it? Where is it? Okay. No. 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 Here, let, let me take a pause here. Okay, I found it. No problem. Here we go. Okay. We're on page 114 of uh, Les Fisher's uh, study book on uh, anti-Semitism in Second International. And we now We'll go through the uh, section, loose turns to mirroring. Okay. Life as an ex-convict was not easy, really. Not only his former anti-Semitic associates wanted no more to do with less, apparently the more established bourgeois and liberal press too, initially showed less the door when he tried to build a new career for himself as a writer. Les was becoming increasingly desperate and it was at this point that he first turned to Mehring. Les hoped that Mehring might be able to help him get published. There was little that Mehring could do in this respect, but he did see to it that a section of Lewis's poems were published in the Nyazeit and wrote a preface to them. In this preface, Mehring also touched on Lewis's political track record. As Mehring saw it, Lewis had been a tireless, extremely skilled propagandist, both in his oratory and in his writing. Quote, he regarded anti-Semitism as his cause, unquote, Mary explained. This, quote, was neither rare nor unnatural among the youth growing up under the influence of the formative experiences of the year 1870. Nevertheless, he contended, an unbridled love of freedom remained at the heart of his nature throughout. Oh, it then transpired that Mehring had in fact received a character reference for Luce from a public figure we have already come across. Rather, ironically, from our point of view, this reference came from none other than Helmut von Gerlach, Luce's former colleague 
and a fellow rising star in the anti-Semitic movement who had also abandoned organized party political anti-Semitism in the meantime. As Mehring explained, Herr V. Gerlach, who knew him back then and whose judgment can count as sound, given that he is the most talented among the younger publicists of the bourgeois press, recently wrote to me about Luce, saying he was an ideal idealist through and through. Whatever he did, he did forcefully. No matter what he undertook, he was always involved with all his soul. As a Frasian, he was a dyed-in-the-wool liberal. Verheitlich gesinnt bis auf die Konschen. For a full-blooded nature of this type, anti-Semitism anti could only be a transitional orientation. Oh, really? So it's a way forward, is it? Mm-hmm. Mehring concluded, and so it was. Ah. Throughout this book, I've claimed that Mehring, in contrast to many of his peers, distinguished quite clearly between the masses who were temporarily duped into supporting the anti-Semitic movement, but destined to see the socialist light, on the other hand, and the activists themselves, on the other, whose anti-Semitism would spell their undoing, and also inculcating the working class with racism. From a credible source, does this assessment of Luce's development not contradict my claim? It obviously would do had Mehring genuinely considered the younger Luce a fully-fledged anti-Semitic activist. I would argue, though, that Mehring essentially assumed Luce never to have been a proper anti-Semite in the first place. He considered Luce's earlier anti-Semitic activism no more than a youthful aberration. Consequently, as Mehring saw it, Luce had ultimately belonged to the duped rather than those who did the duping. This is a rather stiff claim to make when it comes to somebody who had successfully contested a seat in the Reichstag on an anti-Semitic ticket. But this is how Mehring seems to have seen the matter. Hmm. Well, let's take a break. That was too much. Okay, let's continue here with this searing analysis Okay. Now the case of Luce. Okay, this is uh, indicative of the um, basically anti-Semitic nature of the Second International, all of the Second International. <laughs> okay, and that's the problem. Okay, taking Luce's own assurances at face value, Mehring stated that Luce had already been well on his way to reforming himself when he was torn from political life by his criminal conviction. Oh, 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 oh. On his release, Luce had, of course, found all the doors to the bourgeois world closed. The, of course, we might add, refers to the fact that Luce was a convicted perjurer, an ex-convict. From our point of view, at least, one other issue springs to mind that might conceivably have led people to be wary of Luce. The fact that he was a former anti-Semite and his notions regarding the Jews might still be problematic. Yet, not only was this an issue that did not interest Mehring, but it also never even entered his mind that it might interest others. <laughs> the odds are that he was probably right, <laughs> you know, like everybody was anti-Semitic type thing. That Luce was no longer affiliated with an anti-Semitic party was beyond doubt. In that sense, he had ceased to be an anti-Semite. Consequently, his attitudes regarding the Jews were no longer of great interest to anyone except the Jews. The publication of his poems was not the only target, though, that Lewis had set himself before leaving prison, Mehring explained. His other goal was to enlighten the public about the desperate and unworthy state of the prison system. This was surely a deserving cause. It was subsequently agreed that Luce should contribute a number of pieces on the state of the prison system to the Nyozite. He also began a work for the number of leading social democratic papers, among them the Vorwitz, oh, and the Sachsische Arbeiterzeitung, 
Not everyone in the party was equally happy to have Luce on the board, though. And the, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and the matter was discussed in the Reichstag Fraction in December 1899. That's the uh, left wing faction in the uh, parliament. <coughs> <coughs> And again, discussed a year later, when it was finally decided that Luz should no longer be allowed to publish under his name in the Social Democratic Press. Oh, well, no problem. He can publish it under another name, I suppose. He will come back to this intervention by the faction. The faction. Luz presumably never intended to place all of his eggs in one basket anyway. As soon as the opportunity arose, he spread his activities fairly widely, certainly more widely than those than those were likely to find acceptable who felt strongly that party journalists should read carefully when it comes to cooperating with non-socialist publications. Which brings us back to the confrontation in Dresden. As we saw, the issue of collaboration with non-socialist publications had triggered that confrontation. Consequently, the matter of measuring strictness or leniency vis-a-vis -vis loose in this respect could be used as a measure of his credibility. In the run-up to Dresden, Mehring had argued for an extremely strict adherence to the party's principles on collaboration with the non-socialist press. Yet how strictly had he himself applied these principles in Luce's case? Luce had worked on a consultant uh, as a consultant on social affairs for the papers published by the Ulstein Publishing House. These were papers that could justly classify as anti-socialist. He also began to write regularly for the Welt am Montag, a paper edited by his friend Hulmund von Gerlach, who, following his defection from the organized political anti-Semitism, was initially a supporter of Friedrich Naumann's National Socialist Movement. Hmm. No, not National Socialist. No, that comes a bit later. National Social Movement. Okay. Clearly, then, the Welt am Montag was no socialist paper either, to say the least. Why, one might ask, had Mehring not kicked up the sort of fuss about Lise's work for Ostein and Gerlach that he had kicked up about Bernard's article in the Zukunft? Hmm. The case of Hans Luce at the Party Congress in Dresden. Okay, continue. It was against this background that Fischer had raised Luce's case in Dresden. Fischer claimed that he did not oppose the position of the Volkstad on the collaboration with non-socialist press in principle. Quote, I do, however, find it outrageous, and have made no secrets of this fact, that the whole initiative is entirely the result of one of Franz Mehring's personal disagreements, unquote. Mm. The real reason for this entire conflict was Mehring's long-standing struggle with Harden and the Zukunft. Mehring had pounced on this issue for purely personal reasons and then blown it all, all out of proportion. In this instance, Mehring insisted on the highest possible standards, yet one could hardly claim that the Nyazite itself maintained the same high standards in all instances. Fisher was by no means addressing Mehring alone when he raised this issue in Dresden and introduced Lucis's case an example of the double standards allegedly applied by the editors of the Nyazite. Fisher did address one of the journal's editors directly when embarking on his critique, but it was not Mehring he singled out. Quote, take the case of Hans Luce, Fisher exclaimed. Nobody mentioned anything about cleanliness then, commented Kautsky from the floor. Very good. Kautsky was, of course, the de facto editor-in-chief of the Nyazite. As we saw, it was he who encouraged Mehring to take up the issue of Bernard's article in Zekonft and used the opportunity, opportunity to restate the party's position on collaboration with the non-socialist press. <laughs> Speaking immediately before Fischer at the Congress in Dresden, Kautsky emphatically defending Mehring. In his speech, Kautsky also explained his own principles regarding collaboration with Nyazite with non-socialists or recent converts to socialism. He had always maintained a Quote, wariness of anyone who comes to us from the bourgeois parties and used used to fight against us, unquote, Kowski stated. This was, quote, a principle of mine where some of you should do more to embrace, unquote. To Fisher's mind, this only underscored the hypocrisy of the editors of the Nyazite. 
Here was Kautsky claiming that he was extremely reluctant on principle to offer previous opponents of the party a forum in this journal till they had proved themselves. Yet in Lucius's case, Kautsky had abandoned his principles and welcomed Luce without the reservations he supposedly maintained vis-a-vis -vis such newcomers. Luce was an anti-Semitic deputy, Fisher explained. He had been, quote, sent to prison for an act of perjury that he had committed, as Mayering claims, for honorable reasons. Maybe, but he hadn't seduced his friend's wife for honorable reasons. In any case, he was finished, then approached Mayering, who sang his praise. He had a strong democratic bent, etc. Luce was allowed to write for the Neuzeit. At the same time, he wrote articles for the Zeitgeist, a section of the Berliner Tagelblatt, from the floor of the Welt am Montag, too. Nobody mentioned anything about cleanliness then. The Reichstag Faction, the parliamentary faction, had to intervene to ensure that the sense of cleanliness was given its due. I found that outrageous primarily, however, the so-called revisionists were the ones who made the concerted effort to see a cleanly state of affairs reasserted. Okay. This last remark is a little surprising, for as Fisher himself went on to add, the dividing line between Lucas's supporters and detractors had not coincided with the rift between revisionists and non-revisionists, the old school, Alterrechtung, as he called them. Even so, Fisher argued, the crucial point was this. Luce did not actively support the revisionist cause. Mehring, therefore, had no interest in silencing him and consequently felt no need to insist on the hallowed principles regarding collaboration with non-socialist journalists or periodicals. Bernhardt, by contrast, was a revisionist so that Mehring did have an interest in stopping him in his tracks. And he had published his article in the Zukunft of all places, so that the whole conflict had become overdetermined yet further by Mehring's personal squabble with Harden. In this instance, then, Mehring had not one, but two motives for wanting to lash out, and the principles governing the collaboration with the non socialist press provided him with a pretext he needed to do so. As Fischer reiterated a little later in his article in the Armet Teufel, Oster Oberlausitz. He had only brought up Lucis's case to demonstrate that the quest for cleanliness within the Zionist site was very one-sided and only directed against certain people. Since cleanliness was made an issue at the party congress, I thought it appropriate to mention this case too, Fisher concluded, adding that, quote, Mehring is in no position to play the stickler for principles and party schoolmaster. It was this and nothing else that my intervention was intended to demonstrate, unquote. This and nothing else. We have no reason not to believe Fisher. It is perhaps worth recapitulating his line of argument. The issue of collaboration with non-socialist press, in and of itself, was a perfectly debatable one, and on this matter he was not in fundamental disagreement with the Volkstadt. What he found critique-worthy was the reason why this issue was being debated in this instance. <clears throat> The debate was taking place not for reasons that lay in the nature of the matter itself, but because Mehring was using the party's official position as a pretext to embark on one of his personally motivated vendettas. That the party's position was no more than a pretext for Mehring was borne out by the fact that Mehring himself only adhered to that position when it suited him. When he did adhere to the party's position, in other words, he did so not out of principle because it provided him with a pretext allowing him to pursue his own agenda, in this case against the revisionists against Hardin. Where he had no axe to grind, he could not care less about the principles he now enlisted against Bernhard. Well, what's this fifth note here? It would be difficult to credit Luce with any developed or consistent ideological position. Hence, Fisher's point here really was not that, irrespective of his own possible ideological orientation, Luce did not speak out in favor of the revisionist cause. And Mehring, therefore, had no reason to shut him up. Hmm. On this count, Mehring could have equally good reason to reject Luce, of course, given that he had published a lengthy programmatic article in the Zukunft, as we just saw. It is unlikely, though, that Fisher would have been aware of this. Mm -hmm. In this respect, Kautsky was no better than Mehring. He claimed to be extremely wary of offering former political opponents a forum in the Narazite. Yet in Luce's case, he had not thought nothing of it. 
At no point does Fisher give the slightest indication that he is specifically concerned about Lucas's anti-Semitism, if by that we mean more than his former party political affiliation. He doesn't, of course, mention that Luce was a former anti-Semitic deputy. To us, it would seem to follow automatically that Fisher was questioning Luce's position vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, and by implication, the tolerance that Meiring and Kautsky had displayed towards his apparently problematic position by supporting Luce. Kautsky. Hmm. For Fisher and his peers, however, none of this followed at all. That the particular form of opposition to social democracy that Luce had been involved in happened to be organized party political anti-Semitism was neither he here nor there for Fisher's line of argument. Put bluntly, if Luce had been some sort of philosemitic Jewish liberal, it would not have made the slightest bit of difference to Fisher's argument. In Meine Reifertigung, Mehring set aside a whole section for Dear Fall Luz, the Luz case. As he saw it, his support for Luz had been blown out of all proportion. He had recommended a possible publisher for Luz's poems. <clears throat> Colt published a short review of his poems in Naya Zeit and asked Carmen Kautsky to accept a number of essays by Luz on prison discipline for the Naya Zeit. Unquote. That was essentially it. There are two ways in which we can interpret Mayring's claim that his support for Luce had been grossly overestimated. One implication would be that he had done less to support Luce than his critics were making out. The other would be that he was indeed guilty as charged, but that others in the party had also supported Luce at least in equal measure, and that it was therefore ridiculous to single him out for so hefty a critique. Hmm. Wow. That's sensitive, isn't he? Okay, Mehring's somewhat impudent claim that he had a really done for Lusa, apart from recommending him to others, was published a short review of Lusa's poems in the Nizite, allowed Fisher to suggest that Mehring was misrepresenting the facts yet again in an attempt to downplay his support for Luce. As Fisher pointed out with considerable justification, Mehring's short review of Lusa's poems had, quote, in fact, covered three and a half pages in small type, petite type. <laughs> oh, my. Mehring. Not only had Mehring's preface to Lucas's poems not been short, though, it had also done rather more than merely comment on the poems. It, in fact, amounted to the warmest possible recommendation to admit him, Luce, into the party. That may be slightly overstating the case. Yet, as we saw, Mehring's preface did indeed do rather more than just address Lucas's skill as a poet. <laughs> okay. Even so, on balance, would it be hard pressed to suggest that Mehring was trying to deny the degree of his involvement with Luce. Instead, his emphasis lay on the dealings of others within the party with Luce. And the fact that Luce's supporters and detractors could be found among revisionists and non-revisionists alike. Apart from his poems, Mehring explained in Mein Reifertigung, Luce had submitted three or four articles on the prison system to the Nizite that offered valuable insights into the topic. Mehring had known that Luce also wrote for the Welt am Montag. His collaboration with the Berliner Tagenblatt by contrast, was news to him. But then Luce had not actually been a party member, so the usual principles regarding collaboration with the non-socialist press had, a nod, had not applied to him in any way. The Reichstag Fraction had become involved later when Luce began to write for one of the party's dailies. After that, Luce had written nothing more for the Nazite, but had continued to contribute to the Vorwärts, the foreword. The Sassische Arbeiterzeitung, workers' uh, paper, and the Munich uh, Post, the um, Munich Post. These were all papers for which he, Mehring, bore no responsibility and that were firmly under the sway of the revisionists. Fischer was nevertheless right, Mehring added, in stating that neither the revisionists nor their opponents had presented a united front vis-à-vis -vis Luce. 
and Mehring's own camp, only Kautsky and Liebnik had supported him in his dealings. Liebnik? In his dealings with Luce, yet he had been of one mind on this matter with Auer. Eisner, Gadnauer, Sudenkum, and Aldorf Müller, who were all revisionists. On the other hand, Luce's most outspoken opponents had in fact been Meister and Verne, both of whom were stalwarts, stalwarts of the old school. He did not know whether Luce had worked for the party press and had not seen him for more than two years, Bering concluded. Okay, another. <clears throat> Sip of tea. Chinsing and Velverine. As we saw, I, Eisner and Gadnauer intervene. Hmm. As we saw, Mehring claimed that he had been of one mind on Lucas's case with a number of revisionists, including Kurt Eisner, 1867 to 1919, and Georges Gadnauer, 1866 1946. Not so, these two now declared. Writing in the Varvet forward, whose leading editors they were, Eisner and Gadnauer disputed Mehring's account in Mein Reisfertigung. Not that his account was in any way, strictly speaking, wrong. Even so, the reader would be compelled to conclude from it something other than the truth. Mehring had sought to give the impression that the decision of the Varvets to collaborate with Luce had resulted from its revisionist orientation. Yet, the whole truth was that Luce's collaboration with the Borvets and the continuation of this collab collaboration are essentially down to Mehring's influence. He had, quote, still supported his protege with a warmth that we found most sympathetic, even when misgivings about this collaboration were being voiced in the party. From Mehring's Reichfertigung, one could easily conclude that the Nyazite had been loyal enough to the party to close its pages to loose, whereas the Borvets, the Sachsische Arbeitszung, and the Münchner Post had been less unscrupulous. Okay, unquote. In fact, however, the Nyazite had no longer been at liberty to publish texts by Luce in any way, because the Faction had already asked the journal to terminate its collaboration with Luce on 23rd of November, 1899. This seems a slightly odd line of argument. If the Faction felt that Luce was unsuitable to contribute to the Nyazite, would one not expect the editors of the party's other publications, and especially the Borvets, forward to review, to review their collaboration with him too? Admittedly, they had not been ordered by the leadership to terminate their dealings with Luce. Even so, it was surely a legitimate question why they would continue to work with Luce once they had been deemed unfit to contribute to the Nyazite. Eisner and Gadnauer were in any case simply wrong, as Mehring subsequently pointed out. Luce, in fact, wrote a total of three articles for the Nyazite, all under his name. One of these, a short report of hardly three and a half pages, was published before 23rd of November. The other two, however, on prison discipline, mounting to between 14 and 15 pages, were published after 23rd of November. They were, in fact, published in March 1900. As far as Mehring was concerned, this said about as much as one needed to know about the reliability of Eisner and Gadnauer's account. The whole truth, indeed. Eisner and Gadnauer then turned to the faction's second and final decision about Luce, or, to be more specific, to events on the evening following that decision. That evening, Eisner and Gadnauer explained, quote, we were together with Mehring and Luce. Mehring pleaded fervently for the continued employment of the author, that is Luce, and we promised to do so as long as the Revolutionary Party authorities agreed, unquote. Then, about three quarters of a year later, the quote unquote inevitable conflict between Luce and Mehring arose. Why was this conflict, as Eisner and Gadnauer saw it, inevitable? Because Mehring was notoriously so unbalanced and quar quarrelsome that it was only a matter of time before he picked a fight with everyone with whom he was ever involved. Now it was Luce's turn. 
Mehring had promptly written to them, Eisner and Gadenauer related, to say that he had, some time ago, vouched for Luce. He now needed to retract that guarantee. In short, the two editors explained, Hans Luce's collaboration with Vorvis was exclusively Mehring's doing, just as he subsequently requested that we terminate this collaboration. They added, though, that they had not, of course, published Luce's text merely for Mehring's sake, but because they were merited publication. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. That settles that, you know, like guilty. Okay. Mehring's response to Eisner and Gadenauer forms the sixth and final part of the section he appended to the second edition of Mein Rechtsbertingung, his autobiography. In it, he discussed at length the Faction's second and final decision on Luce on December the 10th, 1900, and the events that evening. On this issue, Eisner and Gadenauer had themselves carefully refrained from presenting the whole truth, he argued. That evening, it was not just we, Eisner and Gadenauer, Mehring and Luce, who were together, but a fifth man joined us whose name Eisner and Gadenauer did not mention. They have a good, or rather, a bad reason for not doing so. The fifth man was Sudikun. What had really transcribed, transcribed was this. Sudikum had granted Luce, quote, such extensive leeway in the Sassische Arbeiterzeitung that the press commission in Dresden had become alarmed and prohibited any further collaboration with Luce. Sudikum had declared this decision, quote, an infringement of his editorial rights and tendered his resignation, unquote. Yeah, just like a good anti-Semite. It was these events that had brought the matter before the faction on the 12th of December, 1900, in the first place. Once again, Mehring found it hard to see how any of this could possibly be his responsibility. What then of the events on the evening following the decision by the faction? Earlier, early that evening, Lars visited me, Mehring explained. Quote, he informed me that he had arranged to meet Sidicum and suggested that I accompany him. Since I was interested in the matter, I went along. Zudekum, in turn, came from Reichstag with Gaudnauer, and Gaudnauer phoned, phoned the Wormans to say that Eisner could come over. Naturally, we discussed the decision of the faction. Essentially, it had, been, it had backed the press commission in Dresden, and Zudekum would now have to go. At the same time, it had placed Luss in a position which, in my opinion, he needed to think through on his own. Whether he was able and willing to collaborate with the party press under the conditions set up by the faction, was a matter on which, to my mind, no, 30, no third party could seek to advise him. As far as I could see, he took the matter with perfect calm while Siddiquim openly expressed his dissatisfaction, unquote. <laughs> Later that evening, they had moved on to another venue. Mehring view, walked there with Gaudnauer at his side. Gaudnauer himself, a former editor of the Sassische Arbeiterzeitung, and at the time the member of the Reichstag for the constituency Dresden II, quote, used the opportunity to say to me, we cannot be doing with a press row now in Dresden. Try to persuade Luce to resign voluntarily so that Sudicum can stay. It goes without saying that we would then have to do all that we can to make sure that Luce does not fall through the net. Hmm. Wonder what that means. He, Mehring, had, quote, answered, as far as I know, Luce. He really will resign voluntarily as soon as he realizes that Sudicum wants to stay and that he will already have noticed that quite a while ago. But you are certainly right in this respect. If the matter is to be fixed as you wish, then it is imperative that Luce does not go to the dogs in the process. It was then decided that Gadnauer and Eisner would employ Luce at, as best they could for the Barvets, and that they would at some time seek employment for him in Hamburg, while I offered to address a request to Leipzig. This is what happened on the evening of the 12th of December, 1900. Eisner and Gadnauer knew full well that, although they knew better, they claimed that I pleaded fervently that they employ Luce for the Vorvets, and that the collaboration was exclusively my doing. They intentionally distort the truth so as to be able to construe the inevitable conflict and level the wretched accusation that I distill party issues from personal sympathy and antipathy. But let us move on. Okay. Unquote. All the attempts to, quote, find, however modest, an existence for Luce 
within the framework of the Faction decision of the 12th of December, unquote, had, in the event, proved unfeasible. From Hamburg to Leipzig came the concurring response that one would not hesitate to employ loose, but there were simply no vacancies. Okay. Hence, Luce had, quote, looked around for alternative sources of income and organized his life on a different basis, unquote. He'd done so in ways which struck him, Mehring, as being, quote, incompatible with his collaboration with the party press, however legitimate and impeccable, unquote. Ah, his behavior, quote, might seem to by bourgeois standards. I repeatedly discussed this with Luce in great details. And these advanced, awkward debates then also resulted, as always happens in such cases, in personal ill feeling. I could not but stand to my opinion, while Luce pointed out that he had obligations toward third parties that made it imperative for him to establish a secure existence, which he would not be able to attain under the material and moral pressure of the Faction's decision of 12th December 1900. Hence, he stopped visiting me in July 1901. Yeah, so now we can go and work for the fascists. Okay. And he had lost all control over Lisa's activities. As Mehring then conceded, Luce was, quote, generally perceived of in the party as, and indeed to some extent really, had been my protege, unquote. Hence, he should perhaps have acted immediately back in July 1901 to make clear, quote, in all instances in which I could assume that I shared the responsibility for his collaboration with the party press, and quote, that he no longer felt in a position to vouch for loose. Again, there is no indication here that Myring was in any way trying to deny this actual support for loose, and the extent to which he therefore shared the respons responsibility for loose's collaboration with the party press. He had assumed, though, that, quote, loose would give up his work for the party press anyway, given his new orientation. Three months later, however, this assumption turned out to be erroneous. I found it by coincidence that Luce was still contributing to the party press, unquote. It was at this conjuncture in November 1901 that Mehring had contacted Eisner and Gadnauer and written that, quote, should Luce still be working for the Vorvitz, I could no longer uphold whatever guarantee I had offered for him in the past, unquote. Can we trust Mehring's account? As far as I can tell, Eisner and Gadnauer made no attempt to refute this version of their joint dealings with Luce. We therefore have no reason not to accept Mehring's account as largely accurate. In this light, one can well understand that Mehring felt it was ridiculous to hold him solely responsible for the fact that Luce's forays into the party had not been entirely without success. There's another problem with Eisner and Gadnauer's attempts to wash their hands of all responsibility for Luce's collaboration with the Barvets. They insisted that Lucis's collaboration with the Barbas was exclusively Mehring's doing. Yet they also conceded that, quote, we did not publish Lucis's contribution merely for Mehring's sake, but because they merited publication, unquote. <laughs> okay, well, they just condemned themselves. They themselves had made an active decision to publish Lucis's text. In other words, clearly then Lucis's work for the Barbas was not exclusively down to Mehring. We might note in passing that Mehring and the Volver Vorvarts, the forward, were in fact forever at loggerheads. If Eisner, Gadnauer, and those responsible for the profile of the Vorvets before, alongside, and after them had done as Mehring told them, not only would the Vorvets have been a very different paper, the history of social democracy might well have taken an altogether different course. Whether a reference from Mehring was ultimately more likely to harm or increase a writer's chances of getting published in the Vorvitz is hard to say. Perhaps Mehring's support did help sway Eisner and Gadnauer in the decision to collaborate with Luce. Had they had serious misgivings about Luce, though, the likelihood of their genuinely changing their mind on Mehring's behest would have been extraordinarily slim, to say the least. Mm -hmm. So, their account of... Uh, seeing merit in Luce is upheld. Okay, let's see now. 125. Okay, let's finish section. What then was the actual issue here? Were Gadnauer and Eisner criticizing Mehring because he had supported Luce, although he did not deserve that support? Given that they themselves agreed that Luce's contributions did merit publication, this would hardly make sense. 
What really concerned Eisner and Gadenauer was that Mehring was supposedly not told the truth about what had gone on between them. This, after all, was one of the core accusations leveled at Mehring in Dresden. He tried to portray, portray himself as credible by lying to cover up his opportunism and hypocrisy. The issue does, that was not so much whom or what he specifically lied about, but simply that he lied on a regular basis and did so for purely personal reasons at that time. That it was specifically his dealings with Luce that he had lied about was ultimately neither here nor there, let alone it was relevant that Luce was a former, supposedly, anti-Semite. That the position of Eisner and Gadnauer was hardly informed by profound misgivings about Luce himself is borne out by another remarkable fact. Only three days after they published the rejection of Mehring's version of events in the Veravats, their paper led with an editorial praising Hans Luce's newest published book, Anstem Zachthaus. Ah, Zachthaus, yeah, from the penitentiary. Yeah, uh, literally it means uh, on the um, detention house. Hmm. What did the editorial have to say about Lucas's past? His crime, quote, his crime did not harm his reputation in unprejudiced circles. Ooh, it explained. And that which may have been all too human about the events leading to that crime, the adultery, in other words, it is reputational harm in the eyes of the prejudice because it is common practice among them. Enough. It is not the man we wish to speak of, but his work. Clearly, then, the author of this editorial shared the assumption that Lucius's reputation might be considered compromised, if at all, than due to his criminal conviction. Moreover, the editorial also took Lucius's contention at face value that he had already begun to reform himself prior to his conviction. Lucius himself re related in the book, the editorial explained how being a former anti-Semitic deputy, he then was, he entered prison with all the prejudices of the establishment. So he's not so former. The usual issue arises in us insofar as his conviction cost him a seat in the Reichstag. He was indeed a former deputy, but what of his anti-Semitism? If by that me we mean his notorious, his notions regarding the Jews, rather than merely his former, a formal party political affiliation. In terms of his party political affiliation, Luz was indeed no longer an anti-Semite that is an affiliated anti-Semite. This was beyond doubt, not least because his old associates had in any case disowned him, no matter what his, known, his own intentions might have been. His attitudes towards, quote, the Jewish question, however, seems to have been of no more interest to the author of this Horvitz editorial praising Lucas's book than it was to all the other participants in this debate whom we have met so far. Had they really been the focus of the misgivings formulated by Eisner and Gadnauer, it is surely hard to imagine that the Forvets would have published an editorial praising Lucas's book, let alone would it have done so while the controversy regarding Mehring's involvement with Luz still raged. Mehring by no means stood alone with his general attitude towards Luz then. Quite irrespective of whether Mehring shared his attitude and many, with many or with only very few in the party, though, this is much clearer. This much is clear. The one issue that we would have inclined to think of as the crucial one was never even raised in the dispute. Whether, or to what extent, Lucas's perceptions and prescriptions regarding, quote-unquote, the Jewish question had changed, interested, none of the participants on either side of this confrontation. Yeah, well, because they were anti-Semites. Okay. Enough nonsense for this 15th part of the reading of Les Fischer's The Socialist Response to Anti-Semitism in the German Imperial State during the Second International. And so we continue.